All right, good deal. Good to see you. Good to see you. You guys happy to be here today? Good. I hope you are. I am very happy to be here. What a great, beautiful day to come and uh, continue in this series. Some of you know we've been in this series of sermons now for since the beginning of February. Um, wow, time is flying by, is it not? But here we are in March, and we're still in this series. The series is called What If We Pray? What If We Pray? And we've been actually been going through the Lord's Prayer. The disciples, as you know, came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. And so he did just that. And we're going through the Lord's Prayer that we find here in Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, get your Bible out, get it open, get it ready to roll. Uh, get your pen, get some notes. Uh, hopefully you pull those out and can write just a few things down this morning. Let's continue on in our series, What If We Pray, with a word of prayer. Father, um, as we come to you again today, asking you to lead us and guide us by your Spirit, um, Father, I just pray that you would guide us each to those places in our life that we might be still withholding from you. Today we ask that your will be done, but Father, so often we find that there are those things that draw us away from wanting your will in our life. I pray that you would reveal those things and we would be those people that are quick and ready to surrender to your will to put our trust completely in you so that you will have your way with us, leading us in this life that you want for us. We are so thankful. We love you. We pray. Praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The year was 1987. It occurred on a soccer field in Fayette County. Two teams fighting it out for the state championship. The one team, Morrow High School, the Mighty Mustangs. The other team would be Fayette County High School. We meet on the field. The game is about to start, and that's when it happens. Our coach says, come on, guys, gather around. We all gather in a circle. And it's then that our coach puts his hand in the middle of the circle. Some of the guys are on a knee. Others are just kind of leaning in the best they can. We all place our hands on top of our coach's hand. And he leads us in this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And all the guys together said amen. And then one, two, three, go Mustangs. And we jog out there on the field. The whistle blows, the game begins, another whistle blows, the game ends, and we walk off the field with our heads hanging low. We lost. We lost. I remember thinking to myself, but we prayed the Lord's Prayer. How could we have lost? That's just not right. God, where were you? We did our part, but you didn't show up today. We prayed. Certainly they didn't pray. Why didn't we win, God? Why did we have to suffer a loss? Are you even there? Do you even care? Those are my thoughts. And as those are my thoughts in 1987, I bet probably somewhere along the way you have had very similar thoughts. It might have not been about a championship game. It might have been over a sickness. It might have been over a family member. It might have been over some loss. 
and in our minds we go, why did I not get what I asked for when I prayed? What's wrong? What's going on? That's not the way it's supposed to be. The disciples ask Jesus, they say, teach us to pray. And Jesus responds with, pray like this, our Father. The Lord's Prayer, you know it, you've heard it. And he's teaching them how to pray. When you and I, when we hear the words pray, automatically in our mind, we go to this, teach us to pray in a way that when we pray, it works. When we pray, something happens. When we pray, we get what we ask for. That's really what we want, right? I mean, isn't that, after all, what prayer is all about? We get what we want. But interestingly, in the Lord's Prayer, we find it really is quite the opposite. You see, there's a phrase in there that says something very different than what our mind automatically goes to. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy will be done. Thy will be done. And I've got to be honest with you guys. I don't always like thy will be done. I like better my will be done. That's really what I want, my will to be done. But Jesus says, pray like this, thy will be done. Thy will be done. What does it mean when we pray thy will be done? And is God's will being done when we pray? What is God's will? What does he want? When we pray thy will be done, we're praying that God gets what he wants. Do you know what God wants? Relationship with you. Relationship with you. Do you realize Jesus is saying, pray this way, pray thy will be done. When you pray thy will be done, it's all about relationship. Relationship with God Almighty and you. And so then we begin to see the prayers that are effective, the prayers that are answered. That when we pray, thy will be done, he's leading us, he's drawing us, he's bringing us in that relationship of trust where you and I, where we trust him all the more. You see, when I pray, thy will be done, I'm taking all of this and this person, everything that I am, everything that I hold dear, and I go, here, I put it all in your hands and trust you. Relationship of trust, that's what he calls us to. Are you willing to go there with him? Are you willing to go there with him today? And what I mean by that is, even as I talk, perhaps in your mind is, is brought that, that one thing, that one thing that is the holdout, that one thing in our heart that perhaps, well, I can, I can take everything else and I can give it to you, God, and I can say, thy will be done. You take it, it's yours. I trust in you with this, but there's that one thing that I hold on to. That one thing that I just don't think I can let this go. Don't you see? This is so very important to me. This, this is something that I, I just don't feel like I can say, I will be done with this. Yeah, today we're talking about this trusting relationship and what we're going to find is as we go through these next few verses, each familiar phrase that perhaps you've heard and that you know, what it really circles around to is trust. And trusting in God in this particular area of my life. So maybe perhaps as we go through this, God will reveal what that one area for you specifically, he's saying, trust me, my child. Let me have it. Let me handle it. Give it over to me in prayer. I've got really three things for you to write down this morning. I'm not going to keep you long, but I think we can thoroughly cover these three things in, in these verses, and then uh, uh, next week we'll wrap up the Lord's Prayer. And, and let me just say this. Um, I'm not going to say any more than this, but you don't want to miss next Sunday, okay? Wrapping up the Lord's Prayer, you really don't want to miss next Sunday. So plan to be here for that as we wrap up the Lord's Prayer and then continue on in three more Sundays leading up to Easter with prayer specifically for people in our lives. Okay, so that being said, let's go ahead and write these down. I choose today to trust God, but where is it that we're going to trust him? 
You see, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so we'll begin with your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So write this down. Number one, I choose to trust God through the highs and the lows. I choose to trust God through the highs and the lows. Notice he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'll explain to you what I mean today by the highs and the lows and where it is that you can trust God. Uh, interesting story found in 1 Kings chapter 20. Um, go and read it sometime. But there's a, there's a king, an Aramean king named Ben-Hadad. And he has a great army, and he decides he's going to invade Jerusalem and attack the kingdom, the king of Jerusalem. And so that's what he does. He gathers his troops, he goes to Jerusalem, and he attacks the king and the the armies of Jerusalem, and he is defeated. And he can't figure out why he's defeated. And so he calls his advisors in, and he goes, our army is so great, and we attacked them, and they defeated us. What in the world is going on? And his advisors say, well, here's the problem. You attacked them in the mountains, in the hills of Jerusalem. And what you see in that day and that time, cultures, civilizations would often believe that there are many, many gods, and many gods uh, specialize in certain areas. For instance, there'd be a god that's the god of the mountains, and there'd be another god that's the god of the valleys, and another god that's the god of the seas, and, and all these different gods in different places. And so his advisors are saying to him, you tacked them in the mountains, and obviously their God is the God of the mountains. So here's the plan. Here's what you need to do. You need to go back and attack them in the valleys, and surely you'll defeat them then. And he goes, great idea. I think you're right. And he goes back with his army and attacks them in the valleys. Guess what happens? He's defeated. And he can't figure out why. I attacked him in the mountains. I was defeated. I attacked him in the valleys, and I was defeated only to realize a very tough lesson that the God is the God of everywhere. The highs, the lows, the mountains and the valleys. Now let me ask you this, is your God the God of the mountains and the valleys or is your God the God of just the mountains? You see why I ask that? Because I don't know about you, but, but I, can, I can sing praises to God all day long as long as I'm on a high, as long as things are going well. I can, I can be, man, God is so good. My God is so great. But you know that second that if I find myself in the valleys and my world is not the way I think it should be, then it might become hard for me to praise God. How about you? Do you have the God of the mountains and the valleys or just the God of the mountains? Is it the highs and the lows or just the highs? You see, when we say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're saying your your rule, you reign over all of heaven, but you also rule and reign over this earth. It says right here, Psalms 139, starting in verse seven. David says this, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, guess what? You're there and you're God everywhere. We have a God, it's illustrated here, that a God that is omnipresent, a God that is everywhere, but not only that, a God that everywhere he is, he's all-powerful, he's omnipotent. And not only that, but a God who is all-knowing, and he knows my highs and my lows. And he's still God. He's still God. Maybe maybe you see this in in a game like the game I played in 1987 illustrated when, when God, I can believe in you as long as I'm getting what I think I should get. But it's so tough to believe in you when I look in my world and things don't look the way I think they should, when my will is not being done. I see this so often. Maybe you experience it too. When there's somebody who, who looks at the, the world and they question the reality of God and if there is God and, 
And they would ask the question, and you know what? If God is a good God, and there's bad in the world, and you can look at something that evil is happening here, and it's a terrible thing, and how, if, how could a good God let a bad thing like that happen? If that's the case, then there must not be a God, or at least that's not the God I, I'm going to worship. And maybe you've heard that before. And each time I have to point to the cross. I have to point to the cross because at the cross we begin to get that perspective. We begin to see that maybe, just maybe, that God knows more than I know. Maybe, just maybe, that God is greater and so far beyond what I can possibly conceive. You see, when we look at the cross, we see a very similar situation taking place. Imagine the followers of Jesus, and they've, they've put their whole life into him. They're trusting in him. He's their Lord. He's their Savior. He, they're following him. And so they have this faith, but then suddenly the one that they put their faith and their trust in is taken and he's hung on the cross and he's brutally murdered right before them. He dies. And there they are at the foot of the cross going, how in the world can anything good ever come from something like this? What kind of God would let this happen? And what you and I know that maybe they didn't know then is that's the greatest thing God ever did. It's the greatest thing God ever did. But how many of them walked away from him at that point saying, I've lost my faith. I've lost my faith because I don't get it. I don't see how that God really is in control. And, and so I ask you again, I ask you again, when, when, when you say, thy will be done, are, are, you, are you praying really, thy will be done, that you are God and you are in control and your will will be done in heaven and on earth and in every area of my life? Or do I insist my will, my will in my prayer? We see it played out, and it's, it's always played out so good in Psalms. Uh, David, I think, does it so so well, and let me explain what I'm talking about here. Um, there was a song years ago. Uh, there was a song years ago. It was, uh, uh, I think the name of it was Feelings, but it went, Feelings, oh, 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 feelings. Have you ever remember that song? Yeah? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's funny because how you deal with feelings really reveals a lot about what you think about his will being done. I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Um, feelings, uh, the world offers basically two ways to deal with our feelings, okay? Um, there's the religiosity version of feelings, and, and by and large, religion has been very uncomfortable with feelings. Have you noticed that to be true? Um, and, and so often it's your feelings, they can't be trusted, stuff them, hide them, bury them, and, and that's, how you, that's how you deal with feelings. Now, um, the secularism... Uh, deals with feelings in a very different way. And uh, by and large, they say, go with your feelings. I mean, really feel your feelings, follow your feelings. And so those two different ways of dealing with feelings, one is the religious side says basically bury your feelings, and the other is the secular side that says bow to your feelings, okay? And both of those are a bad way of dealing with feelings, truth be told. Instead, what we find here in Psalms and in God's Word is don't bury your feelings, don't bow to your feelings, but you ready? Pray your feelings. Pray your feelings. And that's what David does right here. He, he has these feelings, he recognizes these feelings, but he brings these feelings to God and basically says, but thy will be done. Let me show you, let me show you. Psalms 143, verse 7. Come quickly, Lord, and answer me. For my depression deepens. You ever been there before? He says, don't turn away from me or I will die. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning. For I am trusting you. Show me where to walk for I give myself to you. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I run to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. Do you see? He's praying those feelings. And so here he, ha and, and things don't seem right, and he's in this valley in his life. 
And he has at times, he's been on, uh, but here he is and he's in a deep depression. He's in this valley and in this valley he's going, but nevertheless, your will be done. You're God, you're God. This is how I feel, but you're God. And so I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you with this. It's interesting. Um, a lot of you know, last Sunday, I wasn't here. And the reason I wasn't here last Sunday um, is because a few weeks ago, a uh, phone call comes into the church office and, and Karen takes the call and, and she contacts me and says, uh, there's a representative from Atlanta Motor Speedway. They want you to come out and pray at the Quick Trip 500 race. And uh, she goes, do you want to do that? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And hung up and, uh, and then I go, ooh, what did I do? And I started thinking about it a little bit, um, thinking about this race, and I've never, I've never done that. And I'm, I mean, first of all, uh, NASCAR has never been my thing. I'm very much out of my element there, okay? Um, I don't even think I've watched an entire race through ever. Uh, but by the way, uh, getting to experience what I did, I might be a new NASCAR fan, okay? Um, but anyway, so I'm... I'm in the weeks leading up to last Sunday, I've got all these thoughts going through my mind. I've got to pray at this NASCAR race. Uh, what do I need to pray? How do I need to pray? Uh, what's going on with a lot of different instructions coming in from the raceway and people saying you need to do this and this and keep it 30 seconds. Don't, don't go over 30 seconds, whatever you do. And uh, all these instructions coming in. So I, I, I went to my office. I was in my office one day um, just after uh, uh, this and and I'm sitting in there with Pastor Jody and Pastor Jack, um, Pastor Glenn, and, uh, and I told him, I said, hey, listen, uh, I'm supposed to go pray at the uh, Quick Trip 500 NASCAR race. And when I said that, uh, Pastor Jody goes, ooh. <laughs> and, and I look at him, he goes, uh, wow, you're, you're going to be praying in front of millions of people. And that's when Pastor Glenn speaks up and he goes, yeah, I don't want to mess that up. <laughs> I'm like, man, with pastors like that, who needs some enemies? <laughs> and so, so I, I, I'm starting to get a little panicked at this point, you know? I'm starting to get panicked and getting panicked. I start trying to think, oh man, I gotta, I gotta make sure in 30 seconds or less I say just the right thing. And then I started thinking about all the people that I'm gonna be praying in front of. And, 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 and they explained to me at the NASCAR, it's like three big organizations that come together with expectations. And it's, it's the NASCAR people and it's the Fox sports people. And then it's the raceway people. And they're all saying, do this and this and this. And then there's the fans and what are the fans? want. I don't know what to do. There might be some fans who don't even want you to pray. And, and maybe I'll pray in a way that might make some people upset and all these thoughts are going through my head. And then on top of that, Madison, my daughter and my wife, Kim, were like, we are so nervous for you. And so it gets to be, we're there at the race on the day, and, do we, do, and they don't know if we're going to pray on the specific time, and they're telling me all these instructions, and, and then at the last second, he goes, go stand right there, and I'm standing there, right there in this spot, yeah, that's the right spot, stand right there, and he goes, I'll hand you a mic, and when I go, three, two, one, you go, you know, and, and so I'm like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, but, but I, I got to tell you something, there was a point, there was a point in all that where, where I realized who I was about to pray to and who I should be praying to. You see, you see, being concerned about this group or this group or this group or this group was really me saying, your will be done, your will be done, your will be done, your will be done. And there had to come a point where I said, no, God, your will be done. Your will be done. And I'll, I'll tell you guys, um, they handed me the mic, the countdown happened, and I began to pray. And, and I'll tell you, I, I really kind of lost all track of time. <laughs> but more than anything, I wanted to make sure with that chance that I had that I would make him known to as many people as I could. And I prayed and 
said amen two minutes later. <laughs> and I looked up and the TV producer had his hand on his forehead, <laughs> was shaking his head like this, mouthing to me, you went way too long. <laughs> but you know what? I might have frustrated a lot of people. But if it's the truth that God's word will not return void, then out there somewhere, somebody heard for the first time and received Jesus as their Savior, and there was applause in heaven over that person coming to know him. But that's what I'm trying to say in anything, anything, anything that we do. It's not your will be done, or your will be done, or your will be done, or your will be done, but it's your will be done. You, for you, and all for you. I choose to trust God through the highs and the lows. Number two, I choose to trust God to sustain me and to satisfy me. Your will be done on, heaven as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You've heard that phrase before, but what in the world could Jesus have been talking about? Give us this day our daily bread. Is he talking about a simple meal? Each day a bite to eat? Or could there be a little bit more here than that? Give us this day our daily bread. Kim and I last week, uh, along with my daughter, we went to Jim and Nick's down there on Highway 81 to eat. Anybody ever eat down there? Yeah, a couple of you have tried it out. We went down there, and we got in line. We were, we were in line behind a couple little old ladies who uh, had just beat us out of their car to the you know, front. And uh, they were, they were walking fast, you know, trying to get in there. But anyway, they took them and seated them uh, there, and the lady came back and, and took us in and seated them right next to those ladies, right next to them at a table. And uh, so much so, let me ask, how many of you, um, you ever eavesdrop, anybody? Anybody ever eavesdrop? Yeah, every hand should have gone up right there, you <laughs> bunch of liars. I know you do. Um, but we sat down, and, uh, and so I couldn't help but, but start to hear what was going on at, at that table. And a waitress came over, and she uh, said, can I get you guys drinks? And, and we said, yeah. And she goes, here's me, and uh, take the time. And she goes, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get you some bread and come back with it. After a little while, she comes back and says, listen, I'm sorry, we've got no bread today. Now, um, if you know at Jim and Nick's, that's like the thing. It's these cheese biscuit uh, d deals. I mean, they're, they're pretty good. And uh, she said, something happened in the kitchen. Uh, somebody messed up, and there will be no bread today. She goes, don't worry about it. We'll get you some chips. I was like, okay, I can deal with some chips. And, and so she left. But then I saw the waitress go up to the other waitress go up to the, 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 the table next to us, those ladies there. And when she said no bread today, you would have thought somebody killed their firstborn. <laughs> they got upset, man. They were getting angry. They started, what, what do you mean no bread today? Well, there's no bread. Something happened. Well, I want some bread, but you can't have bread. We don't have bread. I'm sorry, but I want bread. That's why we came here today. I want my bread. And they were so mad. They were so mad. Well, the waitress goes off, and, and after a little while, she comes back by. In the meantime, this lady has come, and she dropped off our potato chips, some chips right there on the table. And I saw what was happening. I saw what was happening. Those ladies were looking at our table, and they thought we got bread, but we didn't get bread. We only got chips. And that made them even madder. That made them madder. And so they're calling their waitress over there, and the waitress comes back, and, and she starts to point. She goes, they got bread. Why don't we get bread? They got bread, why don't we? The and and the, the waitress over there looked confused and I see her kind of leaning up over our table and she goes, they got chips, they didn't get bread, ma'am. And she goes, well, I want bread. And like, you can't get bread. And I'm thinking about going over there and saying, listen, lady, leave it alone. You're getting no bread today. Finally, it's manager, here's the manager. Call the manager over and they start in on the manager. Where's our bread? Manager, being as nice as he can be, said, I'm sorry, no bread today. Something happened in the kitchen. You're not going to bread. Well, we want bread. We want bread. We want bread. <laughs> it was going bad, man, going bad, just because they didn't get their bread. Why do I tell you that? They were desperate for bread. Are you? Are you? Are you desperate for bread? Isn't it interesting that Jesus, 
He's asked by his disciples. He's asked by his disciples, teach us how to pray. And he says, pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. And then, then you know what else? Later on, Jesus is sitting at a table and he takes a loaf of bread and he breaks it and says, this is my body. This is my body. Another place Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Do you, do you see what's going on? Jesus is saying, pray this way, and he's pointing to himself, to himself. And he's saying, you can't live without the bread of life. And that's why I ask you, are you desperate for bread? Have you gotten to that place in your life where you say, Jesus, I need you. I can't live without you. You are the only thing that really sustains me. You are the only thing that really satisfies me. Christ alone. Christ alone. Let me ask this. Have you ever prayed desperate prayers? Raise your hand if you prayed desperate prayers. I know you have. I know you have. And I especially know you have if you are a parent in here. Yeah, you have. If you're a parent in here, you've prayed desperate. Ever showed you guys the, the stages of parental prayer? Ever showed you guys the stages of parental prayer? Here's, here's how. When, if you're a parent, this is how. These are the prayer stages in your life, okay? When, when first of all, you got that little tiny baby, you're like, oh, Lord, thank you for this little baby. So sweet. Oh, so precious. Thank you, Lord, for this little. Oh, Lord, thank you for this little baby. And then, then, then they grow up. That little baby grows up, becomes a child, and, and it goes from this to, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. And then you know what? You know what? They turn into teenagers. And suddenly it's, oh, God. Oh. Right? Parental stages of prayer right there, man. But I, I ask you, have you ever prayed desperate prayers? And if you have, I know, I know. Most of you as parents, you're going, yeah, obviously, for my child. And I know, the, how, the, I know what, what, how those prayers go. It's, it's a prayer of, oh, God, please help my child not to choose that way. Oh, Lord, rescue them from this and where they're going Keep them away. Lord, help them. Did you realize what every one of those prayers really are? It's you. It's you saying, give us this day our daily Jesus. My kid needs Jesus. Lord, my child needs Jesus because you know, you know that Jesus really is the only one who can transform and change that heart. Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who makes new. Jesus is the one who heals. And you're praying, God, I, I so desperately want Jesus in my child's life. Give us this day our daily bread. The only one who satisfies and sustains. So, I choose to trust God through the highs, the lows, number two, to sustain me and to satisfy me. And finally, number three, I choose to trust God and live in forgiveness. And live in forgiveness. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if Jesus said, pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, period. Well, that's better, right? But no, he keeps on going. He says, as we forgive our debtors. If you notice, read on a little bit in the Lord's Prayer. You get to verse 13 and it says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then in verse 14, Jesus continues. He says, for if you forgive men, 
to their, for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Those are a couple verses a lot of times we pastors like to leave off. That's a hard one. That's a tough one. It's easier just to, to stop. I mean, if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Forgiveness. And living, choosing to live. Trusting God enough you choose to live in forgiveness. You see what happens is, is when you are living in forgiveness and you are experiencing the grace of God, it, if you really experience in the grace of God and the forgiveness of the, that you find through the Lord Jesus Christ, it transforms you and it changes you. It makes you a new person. It changes the way you think. It even, it, all that grace cannot stop here, but it begins to flow out through you to other people, the real grace of God. Let me, let, me, let me read in Psalms 51. Verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart. And this is David again. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Look what happens then. As God, as God begins to work in his heart and deals with his heart and forgives him and restores in him that clean heart, look what happens. Then I will teach your transgressors, transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Let me finish illustrating it this way. Uh, imagine with me the spring break and you find yourself on a beach. And, and you're looking out over the most beautiful ocean you can imagine. Uh, the water is maybe uh, a deep blue or a bright emerald color, clear as can be, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. And, and, and you can't stand it any longer, and you, you wade out into the surf. And as you do, it's more than you ever thought or imagined or dreamed. It's just the perfect temperature. And, and you feel the, these continual waves just kind of uh, coming over. Your, it's so refreshing. It, it's, you, can't, you can't hardly stand it. It's, it. You feel so wonderful in this ocean. And just though as you're enjoying uh, just being in this huge, vast, broad ocean, you look to the beach, and there on the beach there's somebody who's walking down the beach towards the water. And automatically you say, no, 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 no. This is, this is my ocean. This ocean is not big enough for two people. They, they better not get in my ocean. This is for me to enjoy. This is mine. And, and, and here they come. They keep coming. And so you start yelling at them, no, go, get back. They keep walking. They keep heading towards the water, and it's frustrating. You're getting so upset that, that you begin to wade out of the water yourself. you got to do anything you can to keep them from wading into that ocean because it's yours. And sure enough, you soon find yourself wrestling with them, holding them back. You can't get in my ocean to the point that you're, you're laying on the, on, on, the, on the ground with your arms wrapped around their feet and their legs, doing everything you can to keep them from getting into your ocean. Let me back up. Imagine yourself on a beach looking out over the most beautiful ocean you've ever seen. You can't hardly believe it. You begin to wade out into it. And you feel waves of mercy crashing over your shoulders. You feel the joy and the light of this sea of grace that God has allowed you to swim in. The forgiveness is overwhelming. The joy is too much. It's unbelievable that, that you have been blessed in this way. Your sin is forgiven and grace is so 
being enjoyed. But then you look to the beach and you see somebody coming and you go, oh no, not them. They're not getting in my ocean. They don't deserve it. After what they did, after how they hurt, I can't let them in this ocean. It's mine. It's not big enough for the two of us. You start finding yourself wading back out of the surf just to keep them from experiencing the joy and the thrill and the grace and the mercy that you have felt yourself. How, how dare they think? I will not. I will make them pay. Somebody, somebody can't let them get over, just get away with it. And you wrestle and you hold on to them only to find out that you yourself are no longer in the very grace that you're trying to keep them from enjoying. All oh, that we would let go. And in the sea of forgiveness, the sea of grace, give forgiveness and grace. As you have been forgiven in Jesus Christ, so forgive. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Like I said, it all comes down to trust. A relationship of trust. Friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you would say, I don't have that kind of relationship. I want you to know you can today. He invites you into that relationship with himself. Understanding that right here, right now, you can call out to him and say, Jesus, I need you. And I would encourage you, please, please, don't put that off. Do that. Christ died so that you can live. He gives forgiveness so you can go free. You can enjoy the grace. You can live in it, that relationship of trust. So here, now, today, call out to Jesus. Quietly in your own mind, he hears your, he hears your thoughts. He knows them. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you today to be my God, my Savior, my friend forever. I trust you. Friend, when you pray that prayer and you lean with your heart, the Bible says you can know you have eternal life. in a relationship with him that will never, ever end. What one thing, what one thing? Father, that one thing that I hold out that so many of us hold on to, to that we feel like we can't trust you with, I pray here now, in this moment we go here. Here, it's yours. Maybe it's, it's our feelings, maybe it's the, the ups and the downs, the worries that we would trust you, the God who is over all. Trust you. Or our Father, maybe, maybe it's that, that hurt, that pain, that not being able to forgive, that we would let that go and trust you. Live in that joy and live in that freedom, Father. Father, through it all, we want your son, Jesus, the bread, living in and through us. Have your way with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.